Father, thank you so much for this time. Thank you for um, what an opportunity it is for all of us to, to come here and learn from one another. We thank you for the classical Christian education movement. We thank you for what you're doing and seeing your obvious hand of blessing there. Um, I pray for this time. I pray it be valuable. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I think I've met most of you at some point, or you've been in one of the sessions before. My name is Scott Welch. I've um, been teaching for about 17 or 18 years. Um, spent 16 years at the River Academy in Wenatchee, Washington, and now I'm at the Oaks in Spokane. I've been there for a couple years. Um, I teach logic, classical literature, and junior rhetoric. And so um, over the last 20 years, as probably most of you that have been in education for very long or in classical Christian education, if you've been any near, anywhere near a startup school, you find that you don't always just teach exactly what you want to teach. Um, I, know, I know in 20 years, I think I taught 23 different classes we figured out at one point. So whatever, they would say, well, we know you're teaching logic and Latin. So out of these six choices, what would you like? Geometry, general science, 7th and 8th grade ELA. And it's like... Um, and so it's kind of funny, but the one thing that's been standard throughout my whole time is um, logic. There's, there's a, a, there are not a lot, lot of logic teachers out there, so I've, I've, my job has been secure. But um, quite a few years ago, so after I'd been teaching already for, for over 10 years in logic, um, I started becoming a little bit frustrated, or I don't know if frustrated is the right word, but a little bit, I was wondering if what I was doing was actually doing what I wanted it to do in logic education. And so I, it, the sinking feeling started when I, we had a guest speaker come into our rhetoric class and one of my students, and this is in the junior year, one of my students said something that was, um, well, it was uninspired by logical thought. And so the guy, the guy looks and says, who teaches logic at this school? And I'm sitting in the back, and they all turn and look at me, and I'm sitting there thinking, how did this happen? You know? and, and of course, he was joking. Everybody says things that are illogical. But it actually, the rest of that talk, I'm sitting there thinking, it's, it's interesting that, that that's not the first time I've heard something like that. Or why don't our juniors think logically? Or why does it seem like all of our junior thesis when we first get them, are, they're really struggling to make a strong argument? And so I wanted to kind of defend myself. And I thought, hey, d you should know that she's one of the best students in the class. And she can prove the validity of an EIO3 with the best of them. <laughs> right? Um, or, you know, she's the top of the class when it comes to proving consistency with the shorter truth table method. How could she ever say anything illogical? Um, and so, I guess the worst thing I could have said was, well, the type of logic we teach in eighth grade actually doesn't help them in real world thinking. <laughs> and that was the thing that got me, was I was trying to think, is what I do in eighth grade actually preparing them for logical thought in the, rest of, in the rest of the grades. And that's the question I want to kind of explore with you. Um, I'm going to start out by telling you right now, what I'm talking about today is the beginning of the conversation, not the end of it. I have not figured this all out. I'm th I've been thinking through this. I know that it is the way forward, um, I think, for me. And um, I would love to get um, your thoughts on it. So, um, but anyways, I was just starting to get the sinking feeling that we were not preparing them to, to or training them with the tools of argumentation. So I want to start with what most, what, from, from the schools that I've been acquainted with and the schools that, there you go, the schools I've been acquainted with and the schools that I've talked to and the schools that I've done training at, this is something like what you'll find in an eighth grade logic class, whether you're using Nance's materials, which I use, whether you're using Martin Cawthorn's materials, whether you're using um, a college text like Cohen and Copey or Hurley or whatever you might have taken in college, you'll find something like this in the, in the, in the information. How many of you guys actually teach logic? So some of you do? Okay. And how many of you are rhetoric junior, or you're, you're in junior high or high school? Most of you? Okay. So this is kind of what you'll learn um, in eighth grade formal logic, or eighth grade formal logic is on the left hand side. So you learn catalog categorical logic, terms, definitions, how to define words, what a statement is as opposed to what a sentence is. You'll talk about relationships between statements, supported statements, self-supported statements, consistency, implication, equivalence. Move on to arguments which is in, in deductive logic or informal logic, it's the syllogism. And then you move on to propositional logic. Most people do. Um, Cawthorne's books don't, but I know Nance's books do. They move on to propositional logic, which is proofs and truth tables and things like that. What you'll find is that when it comes to informal logic, or some call it inductive logic, you, 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 ju you study fallacies, and you tend to, you, you get one chapter on enthymemes in Nance's book, 
nothing in a lot of other books. You talk about dilemmas. And what I found with students is I used to constantly answer the question, when am I going to use this in the real world? And I'm thinking, well, it's logic. You can use it all the time. But there wasn't a satisfying answer to them, and, and ultimately it became not a satisfying answer for me as well. And so no matter how much I told them it's, it's going to teach them precision in thinking, which it does, and that's why I think we still teach it, and, and it's important to teach. It teaches them how to think clearly and precisely. Um, though I think it does that, I think that we need to do, we need to do more. So um, one of the problems is, so you teach, you teach it in, in eighth grade. How do we reinforce what's learned in eighth grade? So most, what I found is, at least at the few schools that I've been a part of, not everybody there teaches logic. They you did logic in eighth grade. And then something in ninth grade is usually, um, at our school we take debate, which is considered logic too. Some do material logic. Um, some just consider, you know, you're going to write papers in my class and I'm going to expect good logical thought. Right? And so something like that you find in ninth grade. In tenth grade, I don't know what people do. Some people start rhetoric in 10th grade, and so if they're reading Aristotle's rhetoric, they'll get some, they'll get some logic training. And then in 11th grade, you study logic as a part of logos in, if you study Aristotle's rhetoric. How many of you have, kind of have, an, have, have an idea that Aristotle's rhetoric is somewhere up in your secondary being used? Okay. Well, I love Aristotle's rhetoric. In fact, it took me a long time to love Aristotle's rhetoric. When I first took it in college 20 years ago, um, I had Chris Schlecht as a teacher, if you know who that is. He's up at New St. Andrews College, and I had to outline the entire book. Each book, there are four books, each book was about a 25-page outline. And so I did not leave loving Aristotle's rhetoric. Um, I'm starting to appreciate it now, after 20 years. And part of the reason why is I think he has the answer to what um, I had this sinking feeling about. And so in 11th grade, we kind of pick it back up again in Aristotle's rhetoric. Um, here are a couple quotes. Um, so, because he, he talks about ethos, pathos, and logos. Ethos um, being character, pathos being emotion, and then logos being rhetorical persuasion. And so he talks about those. So we pick logic back up again in 11th grade. Here's what he says, and this is where I started thinking maybe I was missing something. So it says dialectic as a whole, or of one of its parts, to consider every kind of syllogism in a similar manner, it is clear that he who is most capable of examining the matter in form of a syllogism will be in the highest degree a master of rhetorical argument. In other words, we should keep studying syllogisms, which is good. That's why I keep doing it. If to this he also adds a knowledge of the subjects with within, with which with enthymemes deal and the difference between them and logical syllogisms. Okay, so it's good to know syllogisms, but to, to be really good at logical persuasion, you have to deal with the subjects that enthymemes deal with. Okay, so I was thinking enthymemes seem to be important. Now the framers of the current treatises, so Aristotle is writing this rhetoric text at a time when other people are writing rhetoric texts, so he takes his first few pages to tell you how bad all the other ones are. It's kind of his own promotional materials. The framers of the current treatises on rhetoric have constructed but a small portion of that art. The modes of persuasion are the only true constituents of the art. Everything else is merely accessory. Those accessory. Those writers, however, say nothing about enthymemes, which are the substance of rhetorical persuasion. In another book it says, it is the body of rhetorical persuasion. It is what rhetorical persuasion is about, the enthymeme. Okay? But they deal mainly with non-essentials. Because the enthymeme is essential, he says. All right? Also from Aristotle's rhetoric. About the orator's purpose, or proper modes of persuasion, they have nothing to tell us. This is the other writers. That is how, about how to gain skill in enthymemes. And then the last one. Everyone who affects persuasion through proof. If you're effective in persuading, you use either an enthymeme or an example. There is no other way. And so I started thinking... Are enthymemes important? That's where my brain was going. <laughs> I have a chapter on it in, in my Jim Nance uh, logic textbook, and every year I dutifully go through that chapter in about a day. But I really didn't have a sense of what it meant. So I thought I would add some stuff about enthymemes. Um, so what is an enthymeme? Basically, an enthymeme is an argument which with one, in which one premise is not explicitly stated. That's all it is. It's an argument where there's something missing. It's every argument we almost ever make is an enthymeme. Okay? 
So, an argument in which one premise is not explicitly stated. So if you take an example, you have, you should buy the Apex widget because it's a real bargain. That's a, that's an enthymeme. What's interesting about this is that where I think we lack is the ability to take an enthymeme and both understand it and then turn around and create our own. And that's where we're going we're gonna to talk about today. So what is the missing premise here? There's a missing premise. You should buy the Apex widget. That's the conclusion. Why? Because it's a real bargain. There's a missing general rule that they're assuming about the world that they're assuming you agree with already. That you want it or need it. Okay, that you want it or need it. Yep, that would be one, that would be one possible missing premise. All real bargains are things you should buy. Yes. If, something's or if anything is ever a real bargain, you should buy it. Which is a really bad argument. Okay? Um, but that's what the missing premise is. You have a very clear missing premise here that if anything is ever a real bargain, you should buy it. Okay? How about this one? The football team is horrible. It lost its first home game. I've heard, I heard this one, actually. So what's the missing premise? <laughs> By the way, the Patriots, didn't they lose their first five games or something like that? I think. You guys would kind of... That the first home game determines the quality of the team. Yes. Pretty much. If we wanted to put it into an if-then, saying the same exact thing, if you lose your first home game, you're a horrible team. Any team that ever loses their first home game is a horrible team. That's a horrible argument. Right? But you hear students, you ever hear students say something like that? They got killed in their first home game. This is going to be a horrible season. So what's the missing premise? Which you can easily point out to students. So anybody who, who gets destroyed in their first home game is going to have a horrible season? Well, no. Okay. This is one of my favorites. I paid too much for my LA 101 textbook, therefore the Baker bookstore is cheating the students. <laughs> so what's the missing premise there? That if you ever pay too much for something, you got cheated. If you choose to pay too much for something, you got cheated by them somehow. Really bad argument. Okay? The Trinity is not a biblical... I heard this. This actually was said to me. The Trinity is not a biblical doctrine because the word Trinity is in, isn't found anywhere in the Bible. The English word Trinity is not found any word in the, anywhere in the Bible, the do, name of the doctrine. So the missing premise is if, there's a, if a word doesn't appear in the Bible, then you can't have a doctrine about it or something like that, which is a really bad argument. Okay? One of the things that I found was when you can help students start to identify enthymemes and the missing premises, logical fallacies live in the missing premises. Okay? Logical fallacies live in the missing premises. And so being able to determine whether an argument's valid, or in this case, because we're dealing with an inductive argument, we're figuring out whether it's strong or weak. So, Probably for a second I should define the difference between inductive and deductive. Let me do that really quick. So under logic, you're going to get my quick handwriting. There's two types of logic, sometimes called formal and informal. Um, you have inductive and deductive. Um, the example I usually use with my students is, we used to live right next to this house. We lived in a tiny little place, but we lived next to this mansion that was on the water, and she was our landlord, and she would let us go past her house and go down to the beach. It's on Puget Sound. It wasn't like a really nice beach. It was really stinky, but um, when the tide went out, we'd go out, and there's all these rocks there, and when you turn over a rock on the beach, what do you find underneath the rocks? You guys have been to the beach. C crabs, right? There's tons of crabs. They're all over the place. Um, a deductive argument would be something like this. I've gone out and turned over every rock on the beach, and they all have crabs underneath them. Therefore, that rock has crabs underneath it. I've already turned them all over. It's sure. It's for sure. It's either valid or invalid, and it's a for sure argument. An inductive argument is one where you're adding evidence, and you're finding out whether it's strong or weak. So it would be, I turn over one rock, and I go, man, I bet every rock over out here has crabs under it. That's a really weak inductive argument. I turn over a thousand rocks. 
that's a little bit stronger of an inductive argument. We mostly deal in the real world in inductive arguments. Almost everything we learn back here, if I can go back, I don't know how to go back. I don't know. I can only go forward right now on my thing. So, anyways, you'll notice that I, everything over here was formal deductive logic. The little bitty thing over here was inductive logic, the one that we use in the real world every day. <coughs> All right? So, so that's important. Um, the, another example I give about inductive logic is I say, you know, it's, it's 5.30 at night. All of a sudden, I, I, the phone rings. It's dinner time, so of course the phone rings. I answer it. It's, it's a telemarketer, so I hang up. Um, the next night, it's 5.30, phone rings, and I'm like, I go over. It's a telemarketer. The next night, phone rings at 5.30. What are the odds it's a telemarketer? So would you say that's a strong or a weak inductive argument that it's a telemarketer? It's certainly getting stronger, right? The more evidence we get, the stronger the argument. In deductive arguments, it's either yes or no. In inductive arguments, it's either strong or weak based on the amount of evidence you have. So we'll talk more about that um, when we get here in a little bit. All right. So after I realized that enthymemes seemed to hold the answer, or at least the key to, to what I was feeling some angst about, you can't read this. I just added this this morning. I'm sorry, I'll read it for you. The examples I gave you, by the way, are on this sheet. So that's where I got them from. But all it is, is, is this was my first attempt. When I was teaching, and I did it in rhetoric, not in logic, but in rhetoric. This is the list of tons of enthymemes. The apex widget one is on here. The apex widget is right here. Actually, this one says the apex widget is a bargain because it costs less than a dollar. Which is actually a little stronger argument, I guess, if it costs less than a dollar. It probably is a bargain. Um, but I gave them a huge selection of enthymemes and made them go through and give me the missing premise, which I felt like, okay, I taught them enthymemes. Um, so, then I realized, and this is, I can't go back, we're not ready for that one yet. Um, what I realized was that, yes, through logic in eighth grade and through what I was teaching with enthymemes, all I was really doing was teaching them how to find whether or not an argument is good or bad. At no point had we taught them how to form a strong inductive argument. And that's why, big surprise in junior year when they write their junior thesis, they don't write good, strong inductive arguments. They don't write good arguments almost at all, except for a few really strong students or some kids that have done mock trial or your best debaters who had to you know, really think through this. And so I started looking for something. Um, I don't know about you guys, but there's, have you guys ever read Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton? Some of you have. Um, he, he, I think it's in the introduction or in the first chapter. He talks about how he kinds, he, he's talking about going out and trying to find his own orthodoxy. And he, it's, it's like leaving Great Britain and going out and wondering, trying to find a new land. And he finds that he finds this wonderful new land. And it's the other side of Great, like he, he's back in Great Britain again, I think is the way the example works. For me, a few years ago, I just realized there isn't a ton of stuff in classical Christian edu education about how to do this. And so I started reading tons of books outside of the classical Christian education movement. I got into stuff from um, Harvard's Project Zero. I started looking at all kinds of stuff about how other people are teaching this. And what I found was, when I found the best stuff, which is after about, four years of, about three or four years of researching and reading tons of books on this, what I had found was, I got back to a, the best book I found was on classical education. And so it was, it was a very interesting um, trip around. But I came to this book right here, Teaching Argument Writing, which, by the way, if you buy this book and read it, you'll realize that a bunch of the stuff that I'm doing here for you is out of this book. Um, this book was the answer to my questions in a couple different ways um, that I'll talk about in a minute. Who's the author? Uh, George Hillox, Jr. The forward's by Michael W. Smith, not the one that oh. you're thinking of, which is funny. He wrote some really good, so it, it's funny how I ended up getting into the stream of authors that led me to here. So George Hillox, Jr. How do you spell that last name? H-I-L-L-O-C-K-S. George Hillox, Jr. Just passed away, I think, a couple years ago. But um, he, he starts off in the introduction talking about Aristotle and enthymemes, which, is, which was funny because I had, uh, it, 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 this was the, the book that answered my question. So anyways, great book. So what I started doing, this exercise is actually out of that book. What he does is he, 
the answer he gives is what's called the Toulmin method of argumentation. And so how many of you ever heard of Toulmin? A few people. If you've been to college recently, you've probably heard of Toulmin because colleges are realizing strangely that students don't write good, do good, strong, inductive arguments when they come to college. In fact, they're finding they don't write them when they graduate from college. Um, I was just reading a bunch of studies this morning and everybody's complaining. Uh, at the businesses are complaining about students that are graduating from college. College professors are, are complaining about what high schools are doing when it comes to argumentation. And so what he does is he gives them an essay prompt. Actually, I give them this exact sheet right here. I don't know if I, inc I didn't include it in your thing. So what I do is I give them this, it's, it's a prompt that says, um, basically they think that that there should be required, that all teenagers should be required to perform one year of unpaid service for their community right after they graduate from high school. One year of unpaid. And then here's an actual essay that someone turned in. And it has, I have them grade it. In eighth grade, most eighth graders give it a B, which I think is safe. They're just trying to be safe. There were a few A's, there was a couple C's. I think there was one F, and everybody's like, what? Why did you give this an F? Um, when I gave it to my 11th graders, um, most of them passed it. There was only two A's and then two gave it F's. There were a lot of C's. Well, what you'll find is, uh, and I'm going to read it to you real quick, it just says, as a teenager about to graduate from high school, I think it's rather unfair to do, this, do these services without being paid for it. Therefore, I believe we, should have to do these, we shouldn't have to do these services right when we get out of high school. First of all, when people graduate from high school, a majority of people go, either go to a junior college or college. During the summer break, most of them will get jobs to pay for college. Another reason is it takes money to drive around town and do these services. Personally, I think you should use all the unemployed people that receive unemployment checks because they are the ones that have nothing to do. These are my reasons why I think, I think we shouldn't have to do these services. And so I said, if, if they were creating a good persuasive argument, what grade would you give it? Well, what you'll, the reason why I give this is this is an excellent essay to teach them the difference between making a claim and actually giving evidence for something. They give a bunch of unsupported opinions that they don't support. And so this would be an F, obviously, and I think that most people, uh, you know, like I said, two, two gave it Fs, and one of them said, well, they're just given a bunch of opinions without backing them. And I thought, good, you guys can see that. But this is what I use to, to start the Toolman method, and I'm going to go into it more in a minute, but it introduces them to claims and evidence. What is the difference between a claim or an unsupported opinion and evidence for a claim that supports it? So that's the first thing um, that I give them. So, into the Toolman method. So, the way the Toolman method generally works is you start with data. For instance, someone tells you the Apex widget is a real bargain. Okay? Data could also be, you could use the word support or evidence. Um, there's lots of different words you could use for that. So, that's your premises, would be another word. Therefore, you should buy the Apex widget. We see our enthymeme, right? Data, therefore, enthymeme. So there's six parts to the Toolman argument. There's data, there's a claim or a conclusion. There's the warrant, which is that general rule or the missing premise. There's backing, in case someone doesn't believe your warrant. <laughs> you should buy everything that costs less than a dollar. You should buy everything that's a bargain. And someone says, why would I do that? What you give, the, the, the backup is backing. You have qualifiers, which would be, you should usually buy things that are a bargain, or you should probably buy things that are a bargain. And then you have rebuttal, unless you have five of them already. And you don't have to buy an Apex widget. But this is kind of an introduction to what the Toolman method is. It's, again, you have data, the Apex widget is a real bargain, therefore you should buy the Apex widget. You say, well, I, I'm missing a premise here. Oh, yeah, well, you should buy everything that's a real bargain. That's where you look for your fallacies in the warrant. And then you say, well, why should I do that? And they say, well, it's been scientifically proven that purchasing things that are a bargain increases happiness. I made, I made that up. That's really bad. Not true. Don't believe that. Okay, so that's your, that's your backing. Um, scripture is used as backing a lot. Um, laws are used as backing. So things that are more sure, things that y you've been, you know, that are, that are more sure. And again, a, qualify, a qualifier can clarifies, you know, probably should, for the most part, many times when something's a bargain, you should buy it. And then you prepare for rebuttal. 
So that's an introduction to the Toolman method. Now, I do give them this chart, but I don't start with it. And part of the reason why is um, they don't fully understand it when I give them this chart for some reason. I'm not sure why that is. Well, because it's just too, I don't know, just not enough. So between, St so Stephen Toolman in my mind, created the tool. George Hillox, in teaching argument writing, provided the method for teaching it to students. And so um, what he does is he uses this, this um, it's called Slipper Trip. It's out of, uh, there's a bunch of books called Crime and Puzzlement. And he just grabbed this one. This one's a pretty good one. And he uses this to teach the Toolman argumentation. So I introduce them to it. Sometimes I'll give them, I won't, I'll actually I won't even give them the words. We just start with this and go through it. All the information on how to run through this is in that book. Um, so I feel a little bit like I could just have you read the book. But it took, me, it took me about three years of teaching through this to fully understand why it was so valuable. So anyways, so that's this. One of the things about it too is that because the students are having fun doing this as they're learning Toolman, it really is getting their attention. They forget what time it is. So um, Mihai, I think his name is, I forget his name. But anyways, he wrote a book called Flow. Um, which is talking about the flow experience. How do, how do you get students to just, they're so engaged that the, it's like, all right guys, well it's time to go. And they're like, what? No, uh, what can, uh, are we talking about this tomorrow? Um, I, John Milton Gregory calls it secondary passive attention. It's where they're just so engaged in what you're doing that they don't want to leave. That's what this does. So I've taught this now about 15 times and I've never had a student be like, why are we doing this? This is stupid. I don't, when, do I, when am I gonna use this in the real, you don't get that, right? You don't get that kind of stuff. So here's what I want to do. I'm going to read this to you. What I want you to start doing, and if you want to, you can even break into small groups. So I don't know if you want to group up with somebody. But I'm going to give you a couple minutes. I tried to leave lots of time for this part of the exercise. So um, if you want to break up into small groups, or if you two want to come up here, uh, and then you can make a small group there, and if you want to come over here. Um, what I want you to do is start making observations about whether or not you think this lady here, Queenie, is telling the truth. Okay, so here's what it says, and you have it in your, in your sheet as well. It says, at, six, at, at 5 feet 6 and 110 pounds, Queenie Volupides was a sight to behold. And when she tore out of the house after a tiff with her husband Arthur, she went to the country club where there was a party going on. She left the club shortly before 1 in the morning and invited a few friends to follow her home and have one more drink. They got to the Volupides' house about 10 minutes after Queenie, who met them at the door and said, something terrible has happened. Arthur slipped and fell on the stairs. He's coming down for another drink. He still had his glass in his hand, and I think he's dead. Oh my gosh, what should I do? The autopsy confirmed that Arthur had died from a wound on the head and confirmed the fact that he had been drunk. Is Queenie telling the truth? Okay? So from observing this picture and using this information, and like I said, if you want to group up into small groups if you, to, to discuss it, you can. Come up with some observations that you think might tip you off that she's not necessarily telling the truth. And don't expect them to be super strong because there's not, there's not like clear evidence she's guilty in here. So go for it. I'm going to give you about five minutes to think about it and jot down some thoughts. So. <laughs> Yeah. That's important, isn't it? Mm -hmm. 
And why did they get to me? Why is she? Um, Queenie is the one who is. Um, so we're supposed to be doing an observation. She's giving you a job. I wonder if he was dead before she went to the club. So, she just says she's a club. I can bounce off of her, but she says he was coming down for her. I don't know if she was. I don't know if she was. Just your own little I'm thinking I'll just He's a loner. He is. <laughs> just, We're sitting here just talking and he's over here. <laughs> I have those students that just want to, you know, I love it. I can't seem to understand the whole of the thing until I dissect it to yeah. understand each part and put them together. Then I can talk to you about the whole thing. Oh, absolutely. If I try to lecture on something that I don't spe know specific step by step, you bet. I feel disingenuous and I get embarrassed. Yep. And then I'm scared of questions. No, I hear you. I've, I, I've been in that exact situation before. And in 20 years of t teaching and being handed a science book and having someone ask you a question, it's, uh, yeah, I totally understand. Mm, that is a good question. <laughs> yeah. Why did you think to ask that? <laughs> what do you guys think? Anybody else? <laughs> That's great. No, I understand completely. All right, about two minutes left. you kind of assume that the narrator is telling the truth okay. yeah like the tiff okay because the narrator's telling you that I think it's a yeah yeah third kind of third person omnipotent or omniscient yeah they, he knows he knows that she had a tiff everything that she says is what we're questioning yeah 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 I'm with you All right, about 30 more seconds. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started now. So at this point, you guys have some evidence, right? Um, we might be able to draw some sort of conclusion. I think that it's much more fun to go after her lying because there's some interesting <laughs> things going on. If you try to tell her the truth, it's not quite as fun. It's more fun trying to find her lying. So what I usually do at this point is I'll put the claim up on the board that Queenie's lying about Arthur's death or Queenie's lying. 
at some point. And so then we start, I start taking what the students want, want to tell me. So what would be one of the pieces of evidence that make you think that maybe things are a little bit amiss or that, that she's probably lying? Um, give me what you think is your strongest argument first. Anybody? Yeah? Ten minutes in the house before she came out. Okay. Ten minutes is a long time to process a shock. Okay. It could have been 30 seconds. If she was that upset about it, she would have ran out then. Ten minutes is a long time. Okay. Gotcha. So they arrived at her house ten minutes later. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that, so say that, so she's, she would have already been outside the house maybe, if waiting for her friends? Dead, mm -hmm. She would have already started some sort of process to yeah. Or called called oh, the nine one one. Okay, yeah. okay. So um, so just putting some. So she waited ten minutes. Can we argue that? You you can't. Not quite yet. Okay. <laughs> not quite yet. So it's uh, everybody's got their everybody's got their green hats on right now. We're all everything's uh, everything's working towards brainstorming. But we will get to that because we will talk about rebuttal points um, at some point. Part of this though is like I said, my first exercise where I just give them that paper introduces them to claim and evidence and the difference between the two. Now we're adding in warrant. So if this is the piece of evidence. What is the warrant or general rule that makes, connects this to the claim? So this is the conclusion. This is the piece of evidence. There's a missing premise. Generally, you call for help right away. General, yep. So in general, so generally, um, a person doesn't wait 10 minutes to call for help. Okay. Generally, when you fall down the stairs, you don't have the glass unbroken in your hand. Okay, good. Excellent. We're gonna, that's going to be our next, next piece of evidence. In fact, I'm going to put evidence above. That's going to be our next piece of evidence. I like that one. Okay. But let, this one really quick. So now we have a claim. We have a piece of evidence. We've connected the piece of evidence to the claim using the missing premise, the warrant, right? Here is where we start thinking, is that true? This is where we look for fallacies. This is where we look for um, whether or not we really think this is true. Sometimes you can just say something as a piece of evidence and people nod. And it isn't until you write this out that they go, oh, wait a minute. Well, what about, okay, this is where you find your fallacies. This is where you look for the strength of the argument. Now, another piece of, of the Toolman argumentation is this word right here, right, which is a qualifier. So I've now taught them four parts of the Toolman argumentation already, just in the first few minutes. And no one's looking at the clock. No one's asking me why we're doing this. No one's saying, when am I going to use the real world? They're excited about what we're doing. Okay, so we have claim, evidence, warrant, and then a, uh, we have a qualifier to keep us going. All right, so I love that argument. Susan, could you say it again for me? Jeff, well, the glass wasn't broken. If he fell, he wouldn't have an unbroken glass in his hand because he would have probably dropped the glass to grab the rail. Or okay. The glass would have broken as he fell. Okay, so glass is unbroken in his hand. I usually try to break it down into one, one, argue, one, one piece there, but I think they go together. So what's the, you actually already said the warrant. Uh, in, really, the glass mm -hmm. would break if it fell down the stairs. Generally, um, when Wait, someone, you know, so we're talking generally. If someone falls down the stairs with a glass in their hand, the glass wouldn't survive. <laughs> when someone falls. It doesn't remain in their hand. It doesn't remain in their hand. The stairs, they, so instead of talking about glasses, remember we're, we're, we're taking it up a level. So when someone falls down the stairs, they drop what's in their hand. Is that, a, is that fair, more general, they drop? Unless it's really rare, single mouth, and they're going to hang out. <laughs> <laughs> like a baby, fall down, drink it. <laughs> I got in a lot of trouble for writing word there when I did this with my staff because I know that's. I'm sorry. Just, anyways, so um, anyways, generally when someone falls down the stairs, they drop what's in their hand. All right, generally, usually, as a rule, in general. Okay, um, if you look at the back of the sheet, that's the one that I give as an example. If on the very back, you'll see the chart that I give them that we kind of work through. Um, and so, 
then someone says, someone says, well, there was this one time I was carrying my baby brother and I fell down the stairs and I didn't drop him. And I thought, well, that's a great, that's interesting. The value of what you're carrying <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, the, so, babies, single mall, or, yeah, whatever. Six, sixteen year log of bullet. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. I, I like the baby brother a little better, but they, whatever. Single malt, single malt uh, log of bullet. Okay. So um, you take this. So someone, I love when someone mentions that. In fact, I'll sometimes try to draw that out because what does that give me? The fifth part of the Toulmin argument which is the, the, the preparations for a rebuttal. Unless, usually I don't, wouldn't do it like this, I would use a longer board, but I would say unless it is extremely valuable. And they're not drunk. <laughs> and they're not drunk, okay. Unless it's extremely valuable, or unless they're drunk. You could have that as another one. Sure. Being drunk and impaired is normal habit of what you can do. It's just right. clutching and falling. Sure. Now, some people get start getting in a tizzy because they're only thinking about the, I'm thinking about the Toolman argument method. They're thinking about actually winning, right? <laughs> so like, no, wait a minute. What if, I, you know, sometimes if you, I, I, you know. So, but what I'm, what I'm looking for here is unless and unless. And then we get to, I say, well, now we have five parts. We have the claim. We have the evidence. We have the warrant. We have the qualifier. And we have preparations for a rebuttal. Right? So if I were writing a, an argument using the six parts of discourse or whatever type I'm using, I'm basically writing down my thesis statement, whatever, what three points I plan using in my proof, what I think I'm going to have to rebut. And, yes, and you don't always state the warrants. That's part of the point. Sometimes you do because you want to make sure your, your argument's understood, but that's the whole point of a warrant. Most of the time, you don't have to state it. Um, I'm going to show you an example of a paper that a student actually wrote at the end of this two weeks ago, Megan Tallman. She's an eighth grader at the school right now. Um, and she's, she's bright, um, but I, usually, I mainly chose her. She has the best handwriting. But um, <laughs> there are other students brighter in the class, but she's, she's a, she, uh, you know, anyway, so I'll show you an example. And um, so anyways, we have five parts of the, the Toolman argumentation in 15 minutes and they get it. They understand it. Okay? So let's do another one just for fun. <laughs> so what you got? Yeah, if, if he fell down the stairs, so it doesn't say this, it says he fell on the stairs, but if he fell down the stairs, mm -hmm. I would imagine the stuff on the wall would be disheveled somehow, some way. Okay. So the stuff on the wall is undisturbed. Is that fair? Yeah. Okay. How about this one? Yeah. He was coming down for another drink. Mm hmm. That, what would that assume? That he had drank the last one. And that the alcohol was downstairs. Yeah. Would that be indeed the case? Was the alcohol cabinet upstairs? We don't know. Coming down for another drink? We don't know. That's a good How one. How did she know he was coming down for another that's a good question. Yeah. Some of those, like with that one right there, I, I'm, what I'll usually do is, because I like that one and I think it would be good to explore, but it's a little more complex. There's about five I have in mind that I'll try to guide them towards. I love that thought. Um, sometimes if it doesn't give me enough info here, I'll say, well, let's hold on to that one. That's what I'd probably do with that one. Sometimes people say, you know, I think that she hit him on the back of the head. Someone thought it, I'm sure. Someone hit him on the back of the head with a pan and they're burning off the evidence. I get that every year from somebody in the class. <laughs> that they hit, they, that she, she hit him on the back of the head with this and she's burning off the evidence. <laughs> yeah, they, they got it all figured out. But I don't, let, I don't necessarily put that one up there because I, it doesn't have a super strong warrant for me. Um, usually when people, I guess y when someone kills someone, they usually try to destroy the evidence. I guess that wouldn't be a bad warrant. But I do like it. Let's, with the one we have here, though, the stuff on the walls is undisturbed. Let's go ahead and complete the circle with that one. So what's the warrant then? What do you think? I think you already kind of stated it. Yeah. What is it? When people fall down the stairs, they and knock things. Right. They, they usually disturb things around them. Okay. And so, for the sake of time, I'm not going to write it out. But you get how that works. So we have, like I said, we have five 
parts of this. Now, let's say someone says, um, the only person doesn't wait 10 minutes to call for help. Say, I don't know. How do you know that? Like, how could you possibly know that? Well, I'm sure there have been studies done on something like that. So this is where some research comes in. So someone says, so we have five parts of the six, six parts of Toolman. Claim, evidence, warrant, qualification, prepare, preparation for a rebuttal. The, the last part is backing for a warrant. So if someone says, well, I just don't agree with that. Like, I don't think that someone, I, I think that they might be in shock. You never know what would happen. Maybe they've been over there trying to do CPR. I mean, you never know what they might have done. So then you would say, well, studies have shown, I'm going to make something up. Studies have shown that people don't tend to wait 10 minutes to call. They usually call 911 immediately when they see the person is um, unresponsive. That's probably not true. But anyways, that would be an example of, um, of backing. Some sort of, you know, you have your general rule. Um, these usually go, go unspoken. That's why they're so deceptive and so hard to find. Um, when someone finally says it, now we can start having a debate about the real things that people are getting at. Right? That's why I think this is so valuable, both in being able to look at someone's argument and being able to prepare your own, is it actually takes the whole thing and lays it out and you start thinking, where, where's the weakness here? Where's the strength of this argument? Um, some of these are going to be stronger than others. I usually have them do about 10 of these, um, 10 of these, and they choose their three to five strongest and write them out. So just for the sake of time, I think we have about four minutes left. Um, the last thing I give you here is a, is a sample paper. I'm not sure how that came out in the handouts. Is it, it's on the handout. Can you read it? Oh, good. So like I said, Megan Tallman. Um, what I had them do is I, the, the assignment was to write a police report. And so the first thing is they just kind of summarize what, was, what you found. You're writing it from the perspective of a police officer. So you say, these are the things we found. And it says, for the following reasons, we conclude that Queenie is lying. First, Arthur was found lying on his back. That's usually the first one that people, if you fall down the stairs, do you usually land on your back? Sometimes, but I thought it's a good observation. Arthur was found lying on his back. In general, when people fall down the stairs, they land face down. So we conclude that Queenie was lying. Now what I want you to notice is that... This isn't going to win any writing contests, right? No sentence openers. There's not a lot of great transitions. There's not a lot of great adverbs and strong adjectives and pop. I don't want that. I think it's, it gets in the way. This is eighth grade, and what I want is strong, per, as, as good as, I, as they can, argumentation. And so I'm looking for clarity is the main thing I'm looking for. Did she find, did she make a good claim? Did she support it with evidence? And, and for this first assignment, I want every single warrant written out. Okay? So what she might have said here if I didn't require her to write the warrant would be, first, we found Arthur lying on his back. But she claimed that he fell down the stairs. So I think that's, someone could probably say, oh, I can kind of see why that might look like a lie. Um, but I wanted them to be clear, so they said it. Second, Arthur still had the glass in his hand. It's evident that Queenie is lying because for the most part, people, people who have slipped and are falling would drop the glass in order to catch themselves. Okay. And what else did they find? Nothing on the stairs is disturbed. Um, that she waited till her friends came over to tell anyone, so the 10 minutes. And the glass is in Arthur's left hand. It's evident that Queenie is lying because in general when someone's falling, they grab whatever is near to them support, which Arthur couldn't have done because the easiest thing to grab onto is the stair rail. That's a little more complex. But if you're falling... Yeah, because if he fell down the stairs, coming down for a drink, he would have had to turn... Like, first thing to grab would be... Yeah. I kind of forgot we talked about that one. But it was the idea that Queenie gave us that he was coming down the stairs. Indeed, if he's going up the stairs, he could have fallen. It would have mm -hmm. been in his left hand, and he would have fell backwards, and that would explain the face of it. Right, right. And some of the things, too, so it's, it's you know, you look at the time. So some are asking, well, did he die? I, he obviously died while she, one of the, one of the it's kind of cool coincidental that he died while she was there. I mean, I had all night to fall down the stairs looking for another drink. And so, 
Anyways, so this is an example of what we finally do. By the time we get to junior rhetoric, I'm not looking for them to write so woodenly like this, but I am requiring them to do this. Right now, um, with the eighth graders, we've gone through this whole process. We've done a few of these, and now we're doing a debate on um, the resolved is the Revolutionary War, or the, the American colonies were justified in, in revolting against Great Britain. And so the teacher gave them a piece of evidence, for instance, um, one of the pieces of evidence is that they were being taxed without representation, obviously, as, well, as a clear argument to argument. Okay, so um, they were justified in revolting, piece of evidence, they were uh, being taxed without representation. The warrant, if you're being, if you're being taxed without representation, it's okay to revolt against the government. Oh, really? If someone's taking my money the way I don't want, then I can, okay. That requires warrant, or excuse me, backing. They immediately realize when you get to a complex argument like this, it immediately requires backing. All right. So some of the arguments they realize they're going, well, I don't believe that. Um, in, as you keep going here, you can create good warrants by helping students come up with criteria for things. So like in literature, if you say, who's the most courageous person in the Iliad or the Odyssey? A lot of times they're like, I think it's so-and-so, and they'll throw out a reason. What I usually do is I give them about 10 different scenarios, and I say, are they courageous or not? And I, they say yes, and I say, well, what's the criteria then? And they'll say, well, because um, even, though he was, even though he was afraid, he still did it. Okay, so they start giving my criteria. Then whenever I say, well, Hector's the most courageous person. Why? Because he stayed and fought Achilles, even though he knew he was going to die. So if someone, as we came up with the criteria, if someone stays in the face of danger and fights anyway, they're courageous. So um, he talks about how to create warrants from criteria. It's a bigger system, and like I said, the main thing I want is it's the beginning of a conversation. I think Toulmin's the answer. I think that once we teach them that, the, the logic, um, every teacher can use this in their classes, whether it's literature or science or, or anything. So, yeah, question. Following that statement there, yeah. you taught sciences, the sciences before. Yep. Uh, how, do, you, do you have any specific examples of how this could be worked into the topics of biology, like evolution, mm -hmm. or topics in, in chemistry, like isotopes and the age of the earth? Um, yes. Common publications. I have textbooks that I've read. I thought, wait a second, look at that statement. You know, mm -hmm. um, how would that look like? I mean, would you, right. would you find those original materials and have them read them, and then have mm -hmm. this process and, and make arguments, or would you yeah. take a dis, uh, an argument and disar dis, disarticulate it down to the points of, and then try to work them into syllogisms or sure. uh, uh, fallacies or these type of statements? Yeah, you can do it either way. I, I tend to find that students. Depends on what grade they're in, first of all, right. and whether they've had training. We're talking senior level now. Yeah, I would say that if, if you start them early, like in eighth grade with this, by the time they get to be seniors, they should be able to take a, an article and be able to figure out what's the thesis, what are the pieces of evidence they're trying to give me, and are there any, what are the missing premises they're not telling me. I, they should be able to get to that point, um, especially with a little bit of guidance. When it comes to biology, age of the earth, some of those things, I think it's, it's not too hard, especially if you give them a well-written piece, right? Poor writing is, makes it hard to find an argument. I really understand cells, genetics, genetic frequency distributions, populations, right. natural selection, then chance, probabilities, Right, but, but, you, but you can break this down to any level you want. So, so for instance, what the students realize really fast with their junior thesis is that they make a claim here, then they give a piece of evidence. The problem is that each of these pieces of evidence needs support as well. So each one of these subclaims also need to be done like this. This moves up here, the evidence goes over here. You get what I'm saying? So the age of the earth wouldn't be the claim you'd start with. You would talk about something lower level. Um, so, because any, any piece of evidence has to be supported, right? So, every piece of evidence you have has to have some support if you're going to use it. So, when someone says, for instance, um, well, like the example I gave with the, the Revolutionary War, we had to break that down into smaller pieces. Then, when they're getting ready for their debate, they're asking, well, but I haven't proven this yet. And I said, no, you haven't. So, each one of these has to go through this process. So, you have to prove to me by putting up here that... Um, that they weren't given any rep or that they were being taxed without representation. You have to prove they weren't being taxed without representation. 
Right? You can say that if you're being taxed without representation, then you can revolt, but you have to prove that you actually were being taxed without representation. So this piece of evidence has to be a claim. You prove it, then you can use it as evidence. So, yeah. And, you know, one thing I told my students is that I mean, every, every premise in a deductive argument can be backed up or not by induction. I mean, that's the mm -hmm. type of relationship between those two things. Right, right. And so it, I try to challenge every unsupported statement they make. And, and I ask, well, what's, what's the support for that? And you have to ultimately get back to something that's either self-explanatory or that everybody agrees with. So some of these things, or, or you just realize, hey, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens enough that it, it makes us think she's probably lying. That's the point of it, or inductive arguments, is that you're dealing with strength. Like that's, you know, some of these are going to be strong and some are going to be weak and you're helping them. So I give that we do about, well, actually, actually we do 10, we use about seven and they choose their three strongest to put in here. So they're, they're starting to develop what's a strong and what's a weak. We're, we're over time, by the way, by about five minutes. So if you need to take off, take off. If you want to stick around and ask questions, I'd love to talk to you more. Um, like I said, I'd encourage you to check out this particular book. Um, he talks actually about flow experience in here as well, which is the, the whole secondary um, passive memory or uh, attention. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah.